Welcome to this lecture on uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Um, again, this is from P46, one of the earliest um, manuscripts that have all of Paul's writings. Hebrews was originally, not originally, but early on, uh, the early church fathers who put all these letters together, uh, they put Hebrews um, at the very end of Paul's letters and considered Hebrews to be Paul. Uh, Paul's letter is one of the reasons why Hebrews was included into the New Testament canon. But uh, it doesn't say that it's from Paul, and there's nothing in it that resembles anything that Paul ever wrote. Um, so it's a real interesting uh, dilemma with the Hebrews. Uh, but Hebrews is considered one of the general epistles and grouped with the general epistles rather than Paul's letters. Uh, here, this early manuscript, uh, you'll see what I think is pretty fascinating at the, at the top of it. Um, it basically talks about um, to the Hebrew, you know, pros uh, ebro, uh, to the Hebrews. Um, but you'll see kind of in the, to the far right, there's a darker script there. You'll see where somebody later, and this is early on still, uh, corrected some of the, the, the words there. So, uh, that's how these early manuscripts would work. Um, if you remember, the, so the question is whether the letter to the Hebrews is a supersessionist letter or is it trying to reinterpret the tradition? Uh, Ehrman, uh, in the readings for class, completely understands the letter to the Hebrews as a letter that is a supersessionist letter uh, that basically says, that Jesus supersedes the uh, Jewish priesthood and the Jewish uh, sacrificial system that was located at the temple in Jerusalem. Um, so that that and that's a big question. You know, what is um, what is Hebrews all about? We'll get into that in a little bit. But what can we know about this letter? It is an anonymous letter. None of Paul's letters, neither his um, Undisputed or disputed or pastoral epistles are anonymous. Uh, Paul signs all of his letters. Hebrews is not, um, it, it's not, doesn't have an author. So it is an anonymous letter. But it was accepted in the New Te Testament primarily to, because of its association with Paul. Uh, today it's universally accepted as not Pauline among modern scholars. So I don't know of any New Testament professor anywhere that would argue for Pauline authorship of the letter of Hebrews. It was most likely written at the end of the first century based on the content that uh, that's in the letter itself. Uh, that's the problem. You know, how do you date these materials? Scholars do their best uh, with their understanding of early Christian history uh, and where these letters may have fallen in those early debates. And the letter deals specifically with how the early Jesus movement relates to Judaism. And this is fundamentally different than the way Paul negotiates that space. Paul argues for um, specifically Gentiles. They don't have to follow certain parts of the law, specifically parts related to circumcision and food laws and things of that nature. Uh, Hebrews does something really different. It doesn't talk about circumcision or not non-circumcision. It doesn't talk about obeying the law or not obeying the law. Uh, it deals specifically with the priesthood at Jerusalem that would um, offer sacrifices on behalf of people, the Israelite people or the Hebrew people. Um, it, it deals specifically with the priesthood and the sacrificial system in and of itself, uh, how efficacious those sacrifices are and how Jesus uh, is the, the ultimate sacrifice. So as we go into the letter to the Hebrews, we're going to look at structure and content first. So let's talk about structure. Uh, there is nothing in Hebrews that makes it a letter. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to call Hebrews a letter just based on the, the way it's structured itself. It doesn't have any form that would associate it with a letter. It has no epistolary greeting or closing. So just like all of Paul's letters, it says, 
I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, called to the Gentiles. Uh, none of that happens in Hebrews. Hebrews starts abruptly that has, and it has no greetings. It doesn't have any closing to it. Uh, Paul usually has some kind of closing and benediction where he thanks people. Even in Paul's, uh, the, the Deutero-Pauline letters and First and Second Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles, even there, there's closings and greetings to people. Uh, Hebrews has none of that. And, and, is no, and it has nothing to do with Paul's letters and the way it's structured. So Paul has kind of a, his letters or has a strong structure. There's a greeting. There's a thanksgiving that's pretty unique to Paul's letters. There's a body of the letter, and then there's this closing. Hebrews has none of that. So it's structurally, it has nothing to do with Paul's letters. Uh, and it's, in fact, structured more like an extended sermon or homily. So you get, you get the impression when you read the Hebrews that it is meant to be read out loud in front of a church, something like a sermon. It has strong rhetorical style, um, and th th that rhetorical style is very Greek in its style. So, uh, and it's some of the best Greek in the New Testament. It, Luke, Acts, and James, and Hebrews tends to be some of the best Greek um, in the New Testament. So uh, the style is important. The, the argumentation that that's used in Hebrews is very sophisticated. Uh, he has a large vocabulary. A lot of vocabulary in Hebrews is unique to Hebrews. Um, and so for all those reasons, uh, the structure and the style and the grammar and the vocabulary all indicate that Paul didn't write Hebrews at all. This is somebody completely different than Paul. So let's look at the content of Hebrews. Um, in Ehrman, you, he talks about the supersessionist um, theme throughout Hebrews, but the question is, does Hebrews evidence a complete supersessionist understanding of Judaism by Christianity? In other words, does the author of this letter completely understand that Christianity supersedes Judaism, making Judaism irrelevant? Or does it show how early Jewish Christians or Jesus-following Jews interpreted the catastrophic event of the Roman destruction of the temple? Uh, that is a major question uh, for me. Uh, most scholars uh, in the New Testament aren't really kind of dealing with that, but um, that is uh, the way I see the issue. Uh, that's At least that's how I'm framing the issue of how to understand the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, and, and Airmen, if you read Airmen, and, and I shouldn't say if you read, when you read Airmen, you already kind of see this. Um, and supersessionist interpretations understand the writer of Hebrews as one who is deeply familiar with the Jewish priesthood and the sacrificial system in Jerusalem at the temple. Uh, and this writer tried to show how the priesthood and the temple cult was completely superseded by Christianity. So Christianity replaces Judaism through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And uh, so what Jesus has, what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection did was to displace and supersede uh, Judaism proper. Uh, that's the supersensuous understanding. I think Ehrman is reading Hebrews like that. I think it's inescapable the way he describes uh, the content of the letter of Hebrews. Um, but I think, I, I, I disagree with Ehrman. I think the writer of the Hebrews, is, is an, it's, it's an interpretation of the catastrophe of Rome's destruction of the priesthood and the temple, uh, which would necessarily include the entire sacrificial system. And it reframes, and so I think this reframes the supersession as material in Hebrews. In other words, once Rome destroyed the temple, uh, what did it mean to be a Jew, and how could you worship once the priesthood and all of the, the sacrificial system was destroyed. Now, this wasn't new. I mean, this was new to this generation, but 
The destruction of the temple happened in 587 by the Babylonians the first time. And when Babylon came and destroyed the temple, just like the Romans did in 70, they, uh, the Babylonians took the aristocracy, the, the leader, the, the, the royalty, and the priesthood, and they took them to exile in Babylon. Uh, and there in Babylon, without a temple and without priests to sacrifice uh, offerings on behalf of the people, uh, they were left with, like, what do you do? Like, does that mean that our God is not as big as the God of the Babylonians? That's the same kind of question they were asking in the first century. When the Rome destroyed the temple, does that mean that, that our God is not as big as the gods of the Romans? Um, does that mean that uh, our, our whole religion is destroyed and we don't have a way to worship anymore? Well, the turn in ancient uh, Babylon was away from the temple to the text. So the Babylonians basically said, I mean, the, Bab the Jews who uh, faced that catastrophe under Babylonians said, okay, um, we might not have a temple, but God is still um, present, and God, is, God might not be present through the temple, but God is present through the text, the Bible, the Torah. So the Torah became the center of life in Babylonian exile. Um, and so there was a shift of focus from the temple cult to the Torah, uh, and that's where scribes uh, originally became so important. Uh, the priests didn't mediate between human beings and God anymore through sacrifice. The scribes uh, were the intermediary between people um, and God through the text. So uh, that was a reinterpretation of the entire religious life of the Hebrew people. Well, here comes the destruction of the temple in 70, and, and what happens? What do you, what do, you do in, in that kind of um, context? And I think Hebrews is an example of a Jewish Christian who is reinterpreting the tradition after the destruction of the temple by the Romans. So it's, it's less about Christianity superseding Judaism uh, and more about how do we understand our relationship with God when the center of our religious life has been destroyed. And I think Hebrews is saying it's okay, the temple's destroyed and the priesthood has been destroyed by Rome, but it's, it's going to be okay because Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection uh, continues to be, uh, it basically continues tradition. With the absence of the priesthood, Jesus is our priest. In the absence of sacrifices, Jesus is our sacrifice. So Hebrews in reinterprets the catastrophe of Roman destruction of the temple in Jerusalem through this Christological lens uh, about Jesus. So let's talk about the content uh, again, some more. Uh, so my argument here, this reinterpretation of the tradition, is not about the actual content of Hebrews. And this is, uh, I think this is important in a New Testament class. In other words, Airman and I are not disagreeing about what Hebrews says. We're disagreeing about why it says it. Um, and this, this, this argument is a great example of how and why we interpret, it, interpret a text the way we interpret it. Uh, Ehrman is interpreting it this way to basically show um, how the emergence of Christianity. And I think he, he's pretty antagonistic to early Christianity. He, try, he says he's a historian and all that, but he's also an agnostic, a, a, a straight-up agnostic. He says so himself. Uh, which is fine. It doesn't make him less of a biblical scholar. But I do think uh, he's basically saying, I'm being objective when I do this, uh, when I talk about um, this writer, because I think he has, some, he has an agenda by doing this. I don't think it's just objective history. He, by, by looking at this through that lens of supersessionist, it basically shows how early Christianity was so antagonistic to Judaism. And I don't think it was as antagonistic as he is purporting here. I think there was a lot of crossover. Um, 
but he and I totally disagree with each other on why Hebrews was written. And it shows that there are always multiple ways to understand the content of a biblical writing. In other words, am I right or is Airman right? Or is this two ways of seeing the same thing? Uh, as you participate in ministry, as you are preachers and teachers in your congregations, this will be incredibly important for you uh, in everyday life uh, in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are there to kind of propose interpretations to help the life of the community. Uh, and I think it's always important to realize that your, your interpretation, your view is one view among many. And once you accept that, it gives you the capacity to dialogue with others with whom you disagree. And, and in the disagreement, you can learn a lot about what you're talking about uh, or what you're disagreeing about. And uh, I think that's important as we read the biblical text. Um, so in the end, my question is, who benefits from our interpretation and who does not? And those are ethical questions. Um, these are, this is an ethical question related to how and why we use and interpret the Bible the way we do. Uh, so I think the way Airman translation uh, deals with Hebrews uh, is showing a, a strong antagonistic towards early Judaism. Um, and so it has, what, are the re, what are the repercussions of that kind of interpretation for today? Um, I think Airman is basically saying, see, they didn't like each other way back then. Uh, and in my thing, the way I'm interpreting it is like, I, I, I don't think it shows that they disagree with each other. I think this is a struggling community that is facing a catastrophe and doing the best they can by reinterpreting the tradition, just like Jews did it in Babylon. So instead of thinking there's some, any kind of super, supersession here, I think it's uh, uh, a, a, an interpretation that's trying to help console a struggling community. Now, that ha so what, what do you do with that today? I think that is much more helpful today uh, than the way Aaron builds his argument. But, um, you know, his argument is just as valid as mine. Um, it just begs the question, what are we going to do with our interpretations? Why do we interpret things the way we interpret it? who wins and who loses. Um, those, I think those kind of ethical questions are, are always important for pastors to answer. Um, and, and, and not just answer, but uh, these are the kind of questions I think uh, pastors need to struggle with as they provide uh, guidance for Christian communities around the world. Um, that's Hebrews. I hope it's interesting to you. You need to read the, the whole letter. Um, I would invite you to read the letter and then read Airman and listen to this lecture again and determine where you where you know what do you think uh, you know how do you how do you understand it and you can utter, you can absolutely disagree with me and say Airman's spot on um, that's fine but just at least know why you're doing it have any if you have any questions uh, don't hesitate to send me an email.